Hi, Abby. Welcome to the Radical Therapist Podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yes, wonderful. I appreciate you coming on and sharing with us about the work you are doing. And I guess before we get into that, I was wondering if you could start by sharing a bit about your journey and how Reflecting on Justice came about. Yeah, um, I love that you put these together because Reflecting on Justice is really the culmination of all the incredible care and learning that I've received from so many amazing people on my journey um, and me wanting to be part of that and creating more spaces for other therapists on a larger scale. Um, so for context, I grew up in a very working class racialized immigrant family and so a lot of my life and identity was actually centered around like capitalism and surviving these systems, right? Um, but at the time I didn't know that, I didn't have the language for that. And so I couldn't even track what was going on. Um, and then all of that kind of shifted when I got into grad school, when I got into this profession. In the final year of my program, I saw the uh, one and only representation of me and my people. And it was one of massive exploitation on a global scale. And so I had a really big emotional response to that which uh, really surprised me at the time. So I responded like I would anything that surprises me. Uh, I responded by studying. So I got my hands on like all this information and started to unpack what systemic oppression actually is and started seeing things from a different lens and completely transformed the way that I was looking at the world uh, because all these things that I experienced and, and had witnessed and had my privilege shield me from started to make a lot more sense. Um, Unfortunately, the grad school that I went to didn't really spend a lot of time on this, so I was doing a lot of this on my own um, and, and really feeling the overwhelm of that to have to process all of this on my own, to have to find all this information on my own until I met um, Vicky, who um, was a professor at the time and uh, was so pivotal in my journey and I'm very grateful now to call her my supervisor. Um, she really opened up my understanding of what all this meant for therapy because it was in, in grad school that I met her, but she also opened up what this meant for me to be like a human in this world. Um, and it was also through her that I was connected with um, communities of really amazing activists and support workers that I learned a lot from and started to experience the difference between community health spaces versus academia and traditional workspaces. So experiencing this shift personally, and then in the last several years, having had opportunities to take up more space in the profession, I just kept seeing it everywhere. It became so evident that the experience of community was exactly what was missing in our profession. Mm -hmm. um, and, and having like community for justice doing in particular was a yearning that, you know, a lot of therapists I was talking to was yearning for and a lot of the students that I was engaged with um, really wanted. And so one day I thought, OK, well, I can do this. Let, let's just do this. Let's put something together. Um, I always make a joke that uh, community kind of runs in my veins. I literally cannot start projects without like grabbing people to do things with me. Um, so I haphazardly kind of started talking to a friend, Linda, about this idea. And through our conversations, reflecting on justice kind of just emerged into what it is now. Um, so I think even our creation story is one of community emergence and, and my story is one of community emergence, which I think is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about my journey and, and how it culminated into the work that I do now. Wonderful. And I often tell people too that I don't want to do anything alone, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, but. Yeah. Okay. So you, you did point out uh, kind of this distinction. Your, your work is interested in unlearning oppression and embodying justice in and out of the therapy room. And can you say more about this unlearning and your interest in doing this outside of academia? Yeah, that's a really great question. Like there's a there's a lot in that. There's several like big key things. Um, so there's this idea of embodying versus knowing. And then I guess the call to action of taking what we know about systems of oppression and bringing it into therapy, but also bringing it outside of therapy and in life, all of which I hope would be resisting the uh, colonial values of academia. Um, the quote that comes up for me is uh, Steve Biko's. He says the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the minds of the oppressed. And I think that's such a great quote because the ingenuity of oppression is that it's normalized in, in us and we perpetuate it, right? Um, in how we police ourselves and each other, in how we police other people in therapy in particular. Um, so in order for us to make any changes, we have to first unlearn this indoctrination that keeps the system going in the first place. The thing is though, I think we're often trying to unlearn these things in a way that's all very siloed and very academic. 
So even in how I got into this work, like I, my first inclination was to study, right? Um, to learn in this very intellectual manner. And I noticed this a lot in the profession as well. We're really, really great at talking about these issues academically and dissecting it and theorizing about it. But is it really actually transforming us? And that's kind of what I mean when I say like embodying justice. It's like a transformative thing. It's um, something that exists in our being and, and changes who we are fundamentally. And I think speaking a little bit about the piece on academia, the pedagogy of academia doesn't necessarily hold a lot of space for that. Um, a lot of times we're simply learning prescribed methods of you know, doing things the right way or um, understanding things in the right way. And then you, you get tested on how well you measure up to that structure. Um, so it's not really about transformation. It's a lot about assimilation. Um, and, and then the question becomes who gets to decide what we assimilate to. Right. Um, so I don't know, this might be a really bold statement um, and I invite people to have conversations with me and challenge me about it. Um, but I think I think academia by nature is just a process of assimilation that's othering and policing through hierarchy in itself. So and that, that's that's essentially what we're trying to unlearn in the first place. And so. I'm thinking about a quote by Audre Lorde about how the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And so that's why I really think we need to step outside of academia to do this deep, full work. Um, so that, that's that's one piece about, you know, embodying versus um, just intellectually learning about justice. The second piece is really about bringing that transformation, not just within therapy, but also outside of therapy. Within therapy is great and it's so, 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 so needed. I mean, there's so much work that needs to be done, even bringing what we know about justice and oppression into transforming westernized colonial ways of practicing therapy. Um, but I don't think it's ever going to be enough. And so we also need to bring it outside of therapy as well. And I think as therapists, we are in such a unique position to straddle those lines between therapy and activism, you know, mm -hmm. um, like we're viewed as the experts on mental health. And we have this almost like morality privilege type thing. I totally made that up. I don't know if that's a thing. Um, but at the same time, we're connected with so many people from so many different walks of life and also have the space inherent in our profession to create these um, different discourses through our language, through our actions, through our interactions. That's literally what we do on a day to day. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the main um, ethos, I guess, of reflecting on justice is if enough of us shift, the world will then shift with us. Mm -hmm. And so sitting in this position myself, I often find myself wondering, what am I perpetuating if I'm not actively contributing to changing the conditions of society that makes our work so needed in the first place, mm -hmm. right? I don't wanna hear people say, oh, your work is so needed. You're doing so, like, you're such a good force in the world. I'm like, eh, that's not really the point. Let's focus and shift why, why I'm so needed in the first place. Um, and then, Sorry, I keep going on tangents. No, um, <laughs> it <laughs> reminds me of something else as well. Um, it reminds me of what we talk a lot about in Solidarity Group, um, specifically in the context of staying alive in this work and coming up against these like massive violent systems on the day to day that we can only be accountable for what we have the power to be accountable for. But at the same time, I think in this context, and I think it's also implied by the previous statement, but to make explicit that we have to be accountable for what we have the power to be accountable for mm -hmm. and as therapists we are uniquely positioned and have the power to be accountable for this right um so on a similar vein to academia as therapists i think we are really great at talking about it and noticing it when it's coming up and then exploring how it's coming up and how it's affecting the people that we're working with but what are we actually doing collectively and i don't mean doing in like a capitalist production sense, I mean, doing in the transformative, pushing the needle of society where it needs to go sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really believe that knowing what we know and being in positioned in society as we are, it's not only that we can do something, it's that we have a duty to do something, like a duty to support what activists are doing and have been doing to change the system. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's really what I mean when I say, like when I name in and out of the therapy room and then unlearning and embodying justice, we can't let it be an either or, it's a both and, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and you know, you, I, I, did, I did have a recent experience of this challenge. I went to an, a, a, the, what you're describing and went to an event, a community event. Mm. 
about people that were kind of uh, you know direct action doing the work on the ground yeah. and, and i and i was in this event and i was struck with this idea that like man i am i am too theoretical <laughs> right? <laughs> I, i'm uh, or i'm too academia or whatever you want to say it and i, mm -hmm. and I was in this i was in this community for like it was three days and i just got really struck with my own challenges around that right mm -hmm. that, um even on you know even some uh my writing partner jd rigo and i wrote about like instant sociology you know there's this instant psychology and instant sociology even how what's being done with that um at the academia level even people mm -hmm. that want to do justice work and stuff and but then having this then going into like the re, uh, like the ground right and then yeah. and into the community and seeing that um just how you know how it's just not capturing what's really happening on the ground right yeah it's just a really interesting experience for me I, it just, I i walked away from the event going i need to like um metaphorically speaking get out of my head and get into this you know something different so yeah so mm -hmm. i i guess i'm saying you know what you're saying you know i just had this recent experience and it was challenging to me like you know, yeah you know, it's easy for me to think about it you know kind of thing yeah Thank totally <laughs> i think um it, I can I can relate to that bodily experience of that too because you know a lot of where I go is intellectual as well and then when I go into those direct action spaces and seeing people actually making something happen there's like a an energetic shift in me that is very challenging that's like ooh this is kind of asking me to um, be accountable for something that I haven't been doing yet and so yeah I can really relate to that a mix of folks that were you know you had the black church and the white church there and you had just all these people that were doing the work on the ground and mm -hmm. coming from different spaces and um you know stuff we kind of talk about in academia but yeah you know but not you know uh but it's actually really high so I was just I was just really struck and I'm still yeah. thinking about it so I appreciate you yeah. um bringing that forward so okay thanks for sharing that yeah your next question uh your work is also about community and doing the hard work in the community and I, I wonder if you could say a little bit I know you've been talking a little bit about this but a little bit more about your vision of community yeah absolutely so it's really as you said an extension of the idea around being transformed and the idea of both and, right? Um, so it, again, it's great to learn how to do therapy in a justice-oriented lens. I wanna make that really clear that that absolutely needs to happen. Um, and that's something that we cover at Reflecting on Justice as well, but I think it's more important to become different people and what is becoming if it's not relational. So this work in community is really about relationship and social construction. Like we're using our language and relationships as this generative process of creation and transformation. Um, there's so much embodied knowing that can only be co-created within this process. And, um, you know, the reality is you don't know what you don't know. And so community is not just a nice thing to have. It's kind of essential to do this really deep, full, encompassing work. Um, and then if we were go going to go a little bit meta, I think the process in and of itself is unlearning on its own. Like that doing this work in community, we can have these like really sharp, fierce, difficult conversation with each other about how colonial capitalistic values have co-opted us and our connection with our, you know, with other humans, with the land, with the species that share land with us and hold everybody in spaces of radical love and dignity without sacrificing accountability. Um, and so being able to do this, we're essentially living the imagination of a collective liberation. Um, and so I don't know if this is already a thing, it probably is, but I've been calling it relational justice. So if anybody knows like what it's already been coined, please do let me know. Um, I would like to credit that idea to whoever came up with it. Um, but I think when we do this work like this in community and when we relate to each other in a different way, when we refuse to enact on like the punitive othering, dehumanizing indoctrination that's been kind of shoved down our throats, we are creating spaces of justice right here, right now. And so that's transformative. It's not necessarily even about the information. It's just about the relationships that we're building, right? Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, reflect, and to continue, reflecting on justice is also about creating spaces to learn from folks with actual lived experience. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, totally. So um, the image that is coming up for me is water taking shape of the container that it's poured in. And that's kind of what informs this ethic. I think it was in a workshop with um, Travis Heath, actually, where he critiqued what informs psychotherapeutic education. Like, are we adapting to um, communities or having our 
having our communities adapt to us. And so this is also an extension of why academia is not necessarily um, why academia and doing this in academia might be problematic because we're inevit inevitably perpetuating communities having to adapt to us. Um, and I think anybody who's gone through any version of academic publishing can attest to how um, it really, yeah, it really, really dilutes, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Vanillaizes, De depoliticizes, there we go. Depoliticizes uh, the work, right? Um, like, and, and again, who's making those decisions, right? Um, and so when we think about that, what does that mean for impact? We're essentially just pouring our radical water into the colonial container that is academia and the colonial container that is therapy. So ultimately doing that is just doing all of us a disservice because activists and folks living with living experience are the ones that are creating um, leading edge, for lack of better words, leading edge insights and strategizing and all the work that they're doing, they're at the forefront, right? So um, like I teach uh, systemic oppression in a clinical graduate program as well right now. And the feedback that I get from students around what is actually useful are always the materials from activists and folks with living experience or from therapists who, who center the, that work, right? And reference that work because the academic stuff can be really incomplete and sometimes it's just not useful, right? Um, and then again, going meta, we have to look at the impact of that act in itself that when we center the knowledge of folks with living experience to celebrate and focus on their wisdom and the creativity and the joys of their resistance and their liberation, we're changing the discourse there too. It's no longer like a patronizing saviorism thing. We're just doing what we should have always been doing. And it's not about helping folks with living experience, they're helping us understand. Um, and so shifting the narrative there too, and then looking at the impact of that action in and of itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, you, you, you're covering this, but I, I guess I'm wondering more, what are your suggestions, because we're going to have a lot of listeners that, that are kind of in this position, but what are your suggestions to therapists in training that are just starting the hard work of examining the damaging and unjust ways we relate to one another, accountability, and confronting those challenging parts of ourselves? What What's your uh, helpful wisdom? <laughs> well, I want to preface this by saying that I'm, I'm still working on this, um, but it's something that I found is uh, not only the most useful, but the most crucial. Um, the, the piece I really want to emphasize is prioritizing relationship. Like the knowledge will come. The knowledge will always come. The ground zero is doing everything you can to show up in relationship sustainably. Um, and in order for you to do that, you have to know where you are most personally reactive and then practice slowing that down. Take 24 hours. Just notice your, your, something is happening. Take 24 hours before you react to something um, that lands in these spaces for you because it's in this reactivity that can break movements and break communities and break all the spaces where we can practice justice. Um, I've noticed in myself when, when I'm in these reactive spaces, all my colonial ideations and my reactions start coming up, right? And so really taking a moment to step back from that. Um, and a lot of that is letting go of perfectionism and recognizing that um, perfectionism is white supremacy. I think that's Timo Kuhn's work. Um, and then when we think about perfectionism and its relationship with justice doing, we often see that when we prioritize perfectionism, we're centering ourselves and we can no longer do the creative emerging dreaming work of justice doing. Um, and so letting, letting, just let that piece go. It's okay. It doesn't need to be here. Um, and then go find your people. Um, find people that can see you beyond the perfect and are able to explore with you, but also hold you accountable without abandoning you. Um, no one owes you this kind of radical camaraderie, so you have to prioritize building it. It's a give and take. Um, and it's just so magical because when, when critique comes after building a dignity-filled relationship, it becomes all the more transformative, right? Because you hear it, you embody it, you feel it in your bones, and it stays with you. Um, and then, and then the final piece around this is to go out and do something, right? Go support the work of activists that have been doing this for centuries. And I choose my words very carefully here because I wanna make it really clear that we are supporting the work. We're not taking it over because, um, well, I'll speak for me, but that's not really, really my um, place. And it wouldn't be very respectful for me to do that. I'm sure there are therapists out there with different positions and different life experiences than I who, um, can find different balances of straddling 
activism and therapy, um, but recognize that if that's not who you are. And um, if you're going to go out and do that work, I highly recommend reading Dean Spade's work first. Um, their book is called Mutual Aid. Mm -hmm. um, and then get in those spaces and actually do something, right? Go learn by doing. Go learn by doing and being with others. Wonderful. Uh, you, you mentioned Dean Spade's book. I'm wondering uh, what are some of the other essentials for those looking to unlearn or just, uh, you know, do more ways of just ways of practicing therapy? Yeah. So I, um, I know that you, you have a question coming up that tells me about my book list and I'm just going to give you a little preview of the stack of books that I brought for you. It's a big stack. Yeah, um, great. <laughs> but um, I think I think, you know, a more like overview level is to question everything with a decolonizing lens. Um, the more that you're told to not question something with a decolonizing lens, the more you probably should be questioning it. Um, so I'm thinking about questioning um, professional ethics specifically and the ways our professional ethics have been set up by colonial structures and then use psychotherapy as a process to police the folks that we work with. Mm -hmm. So start thinking up um, different ways to integrate transformative justice and disability justice into the structures that you are bound by. Um, there's a book by um, care work by Leah Lakshmi. Um, what's her name? Leah Lakshmi Pepsna Samara Sinha. Um, that has been really transformative in my practice. Um, and so, you know, start there. That's always great. Um, I've incorporated a lot of like care web work into my practice as a way of resisting the structures of policing. Um, so care webs is a disability justice teaching that kind of grew from their resistance, where you start the work by building a network of community members that you are interdependent on and continually have that at the forefront. Um, I think if we as practitioners prioritize interdependence and collective care within our work as therapists, we are making that radical shift in itself from that individualized pathologizing care that we are taught to provide. Um, and it gives the folks we serve and practitioners options, right? Because now we can, we know our hands are tied. We know we're mandated to harm the folks that we serve, but now we have some options to shift from um, engaging that system. Yeah. Um, Along that similar train of thought is to track power and autonomy in your practice. Um, how much power do people you serve actually have access to? How much power do they have to say no to you? How explicitly do you make it that they can say no to you? Um, how do you create spaces for genuine feedback, transparency and collaboration? How are you honoring true autonomy and consent in your therapeutic process with folks? Um, and, and all of this is mutually exclusive with punitive culture, right? You can't have true autonomy and consent if you don't let go of the power of subtly and probably unintentionally punishing your clients for their choices. Mm -hmm. So these are all questions to start considering. So like gather your people and like start looking into these processes. Um, there's a really great resource for that. And it's an article by Kathy Richardson and Vicki Reynolds called Structuring Safety. It's very Googleable. I believe Vicki has it for free on her website. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, more importantly, expand your knowledge from academia. So um, I follow a lot of activist content creators and that's something that's a really great place to start as well. Um, They're just putting out revolutionary work all the time. Um, some of the names of folks I follow, if that would be helpful for yeah, folks please, to know. Please. Uh, Mia Mingus, um, Adrian Marie Brown, um, Leah Lakshmi, Pepsina Samarasina, I already mentioned, Alok, um, and Lydia XC Brown for disability justice, um, Sonia Renee Taylor, um, I could probably keep going and going and going on, but um, follow these folks and start. <laughs> Sorry? That's a great list. Yeah, it's a long list. Um, but yeah, follow these folks and start integrating some of their wisdom into your practice um, and use that as the reconstruction portion of questioning and abolishing harmful practices in therapy. We often think about abolishing the practices. We don't think about creating it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, I promise this is the last one, um, continually becoming a person that is embodying justice in all of your relationships, because the ways in which these punitive colonial ways of relating to each other will be limiting you is what will actually be what will impact what is available for your clients. So you can't do good work without transforming yourself. You are in the room, too. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So those are some some things. Wonderful. Thank you. I mean, uh, two more questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Final, well, this is the second to last question. What books, ideas, thinkers, et cetera, are capturing your attention these days? I am so excited for this question. You have, you have a stack. I like I it. I have a stack. <laughs> this is my favorite question. And when I'm listening to your podcast, I always come to this question with like a pen in hand. I'm so ready to, you know, 
Um, so I grabbed this from my nightstand. Uh, clearly, I'm one of those people who read five million things at once um, yeah. and take in five million things at once. Um, so uh, to, to sum it up, I think lately the theme has been around stories and histories. So um, mm -hmm. books like uh, Crip Kinship um, that shares the art activism story of a performance project called Sins Invalid that emerged interconnectedly with the disability justice framework. So really getting on the ground of like, how, how did this even form in the first place, right? Um, and then Beyond Survival uh, by Leah Lakshmi, um, Pepsna, Samara Sinha. This is um, strategies and stories from the transformative justice movement. So how do we hold people accountable without having to go for the punitive structures? Um, I love the way that she writes. It's very, um, it's very easy to take in, but it's also very deep. Um, I've also been dabbling in um, indigenous poetry. So I have two here, it's the carrying. Oh and the wound is this wound is a world um just to really um sometimes shift into that embodiment piece right because these can still be very intellectual and heady so getting into the the feels so to speak yeah, yeah. um queer core how to punk a revolution this is really cool it's uh the comprehensive overview of a movement that defied both music underground and the lgbtq mainstream community it's an oral history so all the interviews with the people who are part of the process and um they have like a lot of pictures and like newspaper clippings in there um and so really being part of this world and seeing how their living imagination created the world that we live in now is really really cool um and then finally this might be this might give me a little more street cred with um, the people that are listening to this podcast, but this new book by uh, Travis Heath, Tom Carl, sorry, I'll come closer. Yep. Um, Tom, Tom Stone Carlson and David Epstein, Reimagining Narrative Therapy Through Practice Stories and Autoethnography. Um, I've just started this book, um, but it's, uh, it's a really great read for, especially for anybody who's practicing narrative therapy, mm -hmm. to start seeing it from a different lens. Um, I think Travis Heath talks about, you know, decolonizing narrative therapy as well. Um, and so, yeah, super excited about this book. Um, oh, and I'm also listening to um, We Do This Till We Free Us by Miriam Kaba. So that's an abolitionist uh, scholar. And I've listened to that book like maybe three times and every time I get something new from it. So, um, yeah, All right, I love your, books. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> list for everybody. Okay, final question. Okay. Uh, if people want to find you, reach out to you, see what you're doing, how do they find you? Yeah, so um, our website is uh, reflectingonjustice.com. We have a free checklist on the site where uh, we go through the different systems of repression, but also uh, different reflection questions for all the areas that you kind of need to start well, you don't need to, but if you want to, um, to start kind of engaging in this work. Um, we are also pretty active on Instagram. Our handle is reflecting on justice. Um, so follow us on there. Uh, we have some pretty exciting stuff coming up in the fall. So this is a good time to follow us. Um, I'm actually planning an, an event right now. Uh, it's okay. going to be a free community event for us to radicalize our practice. And so um, get on the list so that, you know, I can tell you when it's done and ready to launch. Um, and yeah, look for, looking forward to connecting with folks. Great. Um, Abby, thank you for making the time and coming on and uh, sharing all of that. And, um, and listeners, please reach out to Abby. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. This was fun. Thanks. Great.